Engineering. Striding down the corridor of the, as of recently, single occupant dorm deck, I drop to the door that is my objective. Computer, send alert to the occupant of 506. The computer takes a few moments before answering. No response. Would you like to try again? Irritated, I flap my wing. Computer, Captain's override. Open 506. Wordlessly, the door slides open. With my heart racing a combined 1000 BPM, I step into the gloom and am immediately forced to shut my main spectrum eyes and open my low spectrum eyes in order to see. This reveals an enormous mass, radiating copious quantities of infrared located where any other room would have a bed. I march to the glowing heap and, directing my words at the cooler patch, issue a commanding, get up! The cool patch doesn't stir, but the enveloping warmth shifts. Silently, a head resolves itself with eyes, the diameter of Quaratex, turned towards me. The creature then emits a deep, rumbling growl. None of that, I say, with a gentle flap of my fly feathers against her nose, causing her to chuff and shake her head. I'm not here for you. It's your daddy who needs to wake up. You can stay sleeping in here forever, as far as I'm concerned. The cool patch protests. Don't listen to her, Fluffy. She loves you. <sighs> really? Ah, you're awake. Good. Now get up. We're making port in 43 minutes, and you have to be presentable for all your prospective new Terran friends. Groaning only a little further, my security specialist stands and reveals himself to be entirely nude. I cock a brow tuft and ask, Isn't modesty a Terran concept? Yeah, but it doesn't, you know, apply in the locked bedroom. Plus it's too hot for clothes with Fluffy snuggled around me, he retorts. Why'd you let her snuggle you if you find her heat so stifling? He turns a bemused expression on me. Do you want to tell a 300 kilogram death or predator what she is and is not allowed to snuggle? That is a fair point. After uh, Taylor has thrown on a passable outfit, brushes or a bone outcrops, for some reason, and worked a comb through his curly copper hair and has given his pet Merc Beast a playful goodbye, involving him being repeatedly slammed to the desk with force that would have dented a full body impression into the floor of a non-death order certified cabin, we were able to finally vacate that room. The moment the door closes, I slump, gasping against a wall, and give the Terran a venomous look. I will never forgive you for bringing that thing onto my ship, Taylor. Returning an amused expression, he asks, Why'd you insist on exposing yourself to her when it affects you like this? Well, my name was transferred to other decks when Fluffy moved in, and I literally have to run an evacuation followed by a lookout on the gym to let her get her exercise. No one would hold it against you if you steer clear of her too. I hold up a talon and say, One word, my young Terran friend. Pecking order. The Terran frowns. That's two words, he says, perplexed. I gave an amused chirp. Not a requali, it isn't. He thinks for a moment before shrugging. I guess that's the language of space secretary burst for you. What do you mean, anyway? I cannot allow there to be a creature on this ship that is not aware of who's ultimately in charge. I need only manage her the same way I manage you. Confidence, my preen, only Polly in jest. Confidence? Taylor echoes skeptically. Oh, my dear boy, yes. Both you and she outmass me, outmuscle me, and are more ferocious than me by orders of magnitude. The trick is to pretend that it doesn't matter. I'm the captain, and acting it so makes it so. Clearly so unconvinced, he feigns woundedness. And here I thought we were friends. Turns out you've been using anti-death order mind tricks on me this whole time. He plays a hand over his single heart as if he had been mortally pierced. I shake my head in a tearing expression of mild disapproval. Then Taylor steps in front of me and says, Listen, Cap, in a way which still makes my instincts scream and probably always will, no matter how many more years I know him. What is it, Taylor? I ask, voice permeated with concern. Could I ask that you perhaps don't telegraph to the highs exactly why we need Terrans? His cheeks are flush with IR. My translator trips a little over telegraph, but I get the gist. Taylor, there's no need to be embarrassed. You humanities are a social and highly gregarious species. Looking after that need is nothing to be ashamed of. Humans, Cap. You know it's humans, and it's not that I'm embarrassed. He cuts me off before I can point out that, in the IR spectrum, his face is lit up by the sky of Wakwakwa. It's not just that I'm embarrassed, it's for their sake too. I narrow all four of my eyes. Explain. He thinks for a moment before coming up with an analogy. Terrans do so love their analogies. It's like... Imagine you were dating a Raquali guy, and he admitted to you that he wasn't even a little interested in your personality. It was literally only the fact that you were captain of the Bright Plume that interested him. 
Not really understanding at all, I say, Taylor, I'm already life body to a Rapali guy. Our culture share the concept of monogamy. We've been a hand in frustration, he says. Yeah, so in a hypothetical world where you ain't? I wouldn't care, Taylor. It's natural that I would have a higher calibre of mate from the prestige of being a ship captain. Quarag freely admits the prestige was a large part of what sealed the deal with him. At this, the Terran frowns. I decide to toss him a uh, okla fruit. Though, I suppose, I would probably prefer a mate who was interested in my personality and prestige. Now tell me, O oh wise Terran, crafter of allegory, how does this allegory pertain? He smiles. It's like, you want to be considered worth it on your own, you know. I admit the comparison to Akali dating was a bit butchered. Such a violent language. But, like, you'd be making all the new hires feel like it's not them you're after, just company for me. That kind of feeling of fester. They might resent you, me, the ship, but most damaging, themselves. I am momentarily speechless. Eventually I managed to ask, What's that Terran monster you're always calling yourselves? Galaxy Goblins? Space Orcs, Cap. Yes, that's it. For Space Orcs, you certainly have fragile little spun glass egos. He chuckles at that. Yeah, we do. Wow, that guy was a freak! Taylor huffs dejectedly. It's really hard to tell of you, Terrans. That was considered out of the ordinary even by your standards? I query. Taylor looks genuinely hurt that the question had to be asked. That guy made 15 separate allusions to eating you, Cap. I counted. One allusion is really too many. Yes, that was of normal, even for us. I'm not going to be able to relax until I see him leave the ship. His eyes are glued to the security monitor and he gives a relieved sigh when the repulsive terror steps off the ramp. He takes his finger away from the neutralize button. Authoritatively, he commands the computer... Computer, Blacklist Jax the Butcher Carvin from the ship. If he attempts to gain entry again, hit him with a double dose of Terran certified fast acting tranquilizers, then notify me. Do not wait to receive confirmation. Also, send a recording of that interview to the local authorities, Mart Urgent, with the suggestion that he ought to be considered a person of interest in the recent spate of disappearances in local space. This is why it's nice to have competent subordinates. I give him a Terran nod that suggests I also thought of locking that series of commands with the computer, and he just beat me to the flag rather than the truth. That I was just sitting here stewing in anxiety. So, who's next? I wonder out loud. Sha'anza glances down the list, held in her trunk. Um, next it looks like... Oh, oh dear. Oh no. Her normal, healthy pink face to an off-white. Don't leave us in the dark, Shan. Who's next? And what's got you this worked up? Taylor asks. Wordlessly, research lead Sha'anza slides the holopad across my desk. And I freeze when I see the words written there. Jenny. Mouse McLeod, engineer. Hysterical, Shaanza blurts, We can't hire a Terran engineer. We'd all be out on the street, or worse, by the end of the cycle. Something you guys want to enlighten me about? Taylor quips. Shaking more than when the apparently serial killer was sat across from me, I answer, Terran engineers have a mixed reputation, Taylor. Shaanza trumpets derisively, Mixed? That is the understatement of the Aeon, Captain. I glare at her and she cautiously backs off. An admittedly mostly negative reputation. Certainly they get the job done and they'll even take it upon themselves to improve things that are working perfectly fine already. The problem is that the moment they leave your employ, all the mad labyrinths they've piled up come crashing down for want of maintenance. No one else of any species is even remotely able to see how to maintain, let alone reverse all of the improvements that Terran engineers make. They're generally thought to be a liability in the normal function of interstellar travel. The only time everyone admits you really want a Terran engineer is when you're already in a dire predicament and everyone aboard will die without miraculous intervention. The popular expression to describe this phenomenon is that Terran engineers are touched by the gods of madness and brilliance. Taylor thinks for a moment before speaking. Well, we won't know without meeting her. No group of Terrans is a monolith. Maybe she's an exception to this stereotype. Thinking a moment more, he adds, Mind if I take the lead in this one? Unable to think of any suitable reason not to allow it, and not a little anxious that every moment McLeod sits in ship without a distraction, might be the moment she finds something to improve. I relent and wave an assent. Pressing the intercom, I say, Quack, sweet fruit, would you send Miss McLeod in? My life mate answers almost instantly. Sending her in now, my Okla. Taylor gives me a bemused look. Sweet fruit. Chirping in irritation, I say, Perks of having a life mate come, Secretary, you're going to flirt on the job. And don't you dare make the Secretary Bird Secretary quip again. It wasn't funny the first 140 times. He can see, throwing up his hands. As she enters, I observe that a nickname Mouse is very apt. 
This resemblance, this terran bears the earth rodent, is uncanny. Small, withdrawn, with honey brown hair and protruding ears, is almost enough to make me forget that she's still a death rodent with the strength to cross my ribcage in one hand. Taylor stands and gives her an enthusiastic handshake. She winces. I'm glad to see that that can happen to Terrence as well. Miss McLeod, I'm Chief Security Specialist Victor Taylor. I let out a brief chit that my translator turns into a Terran throat clear. Pausing, Taylor amends, Chief Security Specialist, currently on disciplinary probation. Oh, squeezed McLeod, clearly not knowing what to make of that. This is Captain Dequal, head of the Bright Plume, 27th daughter of High Spire Peak. Everyone calls her Captain, I call her Cap. I give a single exasperated flap of my crown feathers before extending my wing claws for a Terran handshake. She takes them with both unexpected confidence, as Terrans usually find requiring wing claws off-putting, but also supreme gentleness. She makes a good first impression. And this is research lead Shanza. I call her Shan. Shanza nervously raises her trunk in greeting. So, my compatriots here appear to have some reservations about hiring a Terran engineer. McLeod gives a knowing, slightly crestfallen smile. I'm aware that we do have a bit of a uh, reputation, but I can assure you that my experience should speak for itself. In fact, I wrote my master's thesis on the topic of bridging the gap between Terran and non-Terran design philosophies by means of compromising some of the performance demanded by Terran traditional thinking in exchange for a disproportionate return in the last ability and ease of maintenance favoured by garden welders. She produces a hollow pad and taps at it for a moment, before turning it around to face me. If you'll look at these examples of my work, you'll see I've taken great pains to make them approachable to non-Terrans, with detailed instructions largely absent of the dense jargon so characteristic of Terran engineering. I look at the images. They are indeed impressively approachable. So much so that even I can somewhat understand them with no engineering background. The interview progresses for another 30 minutes, with McLeod making favourable impression after favourable impression. In the end, I am forced to ignore the pleading eyes of my research lead and tentatively offer her a position aboard my ship. She's clearly pleased with Chris. Tentatively, is there another stage to this interview? I do my best to keep an impassive expression. Yes, you and all of the others tentatively offer positions will face a final test of your suitability in Starboard Dorm, Deck 5, which, if you pass, will become your living quarters. She flashes a nervous expression, briefly, but appears to have intuited that that will be all she finds out about the test for now. If you'll please tell my secretary to show you to the nearest rec room, it's just you at the moment, but hopefully soon you'll be joined by other successful applicants. I smile. She nods before exiting. Consulting my notes, I remark, that makes six. An engineer, a cook, a researcher, and three security officers. That's always enough to fill the entire dorm. Taylor waves a hand in negation. Let's not count our species-appropriate chicken equivalents. They've still got to pass the test. Also, I think there's one more applicant. 23, right? We've only seen 22. Frowning at my holopad, I realised that there was indeed an applicant that I had overlooked. Toon? No last name given. I turn to Taylor. Is that a Terran name? Do some Terrans not have last names? Taylor shrugs. Could be. Can't pretend to be familiar with every Terran culture. Let's bring him in and see. Quark, would you please send in the last applicant? Ms. Toon Elf. No last name given. Auxiliary security officer? Taking a few moments longer than before, he responds uncertainly. Yes, she is coming through now. When the door opens, I have to think extremely hard about whether the creature I'm looking at is a Terran or not. The midnight blue skin, white hair, pointed ears, and luminescent eyes are certainly not typical of Terrans, but on the other hand, Terrans do sometimes go in for somewhat extreme aesthetic body modifications. It requires me glancing at Taylor to double check that, no, four arms with four fingers each is not a normal amount for a Terran. It's two and five. Two and five. Miss Toon is not Terran, I've concluded. Then she extends her arm in a very Terran greeting and says, in what my translator informs me is flawless English, Hello, my name is Toon. I'm very pleased to meet all of you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity.